On this episode of the Bronze Medalist Podcast, we talk about 1992's Images and Words by Dream Theater. Welcome to another episode of the Bronze Medalist Podcast. I'm Kale. I'm OJ. We're two professional broadcasters. We like metal and we like talking about it. And today, mm-hmm. I'm bringing an album that came out before I was born. Indeed. Which doesn't happen very often. An album when I was still a teenager. You were but a young lad. I, I graduated from high school when this album came out. 1992. Indeed. And uh, yeah, this is Dream Theater's most... A commercially successful album. I don't know if that's like the, you know, by the the actual numbers still today, mm-hmm. or if that's you could adjust album sales by inflation or whatever you want to call it. Sure, but uh, this is the, this is the album that contains on it their only uh, ever top ten hit. Mm-hmm. Pull me of under any kind. It's the, yeah. the opening track on the album, and uh, uh, yeah, it's it's a song <clears throat> that they've continued to play live. Mm-hmm. throughout their career because it's it's one that everybody knows mm-hmm. basically if you've if you've heard any dream theater song yeah you've heard pull me under uh-huh. uh unless you're me where you came into dream theater on their one of their most dense uh you know <laughs> progressive concept albums um that has its genesis with mm-hmm. this out the you know you can trace the the ideas for that album mm-hmm down to a track on this album. Uh, we'll talk more about that sure. later. Uh, first, how, how have you been since we last recorded? I, I'm fine. Uh, as you know, last weekend, uh, I went to down to the Mandan Water Park. Took the kids down yeah. to Raging Rivers in, in Mandan, North Dakota. Yes, yeah, so it was me, just me and the 10-year-old. Yes, uh, oh, okay. The, the teen has her, uh, their best friend. Down in, there in, in the Bismarck, Bismarck Mandan area. area. Yeah. So you you took Maximus up all the water slides and yeah. down all the water slides yeah, and ran up all, all the water slides. Oh, yeah. And down them again and up them For again. For three and a half hours. We went on the Lazy River. The Lazy River is not quite as lazy as you think. Oh, it's not. It's, there's, a, there's a wave uh, generator. There is. So it splashes you all around yeah. and there's waterfalls. And it's fun. It's great fun. And then we went home. Uh, at the end of the day, we had uh, dinner at Famous Dave's. Down there, and then uh, then drove home, and it was a good evening. Kids went to bed. It's like night, Dad. I love you, kid. Watch some TV. Then oh, I went to bed. Next morning, sun rises. I was completely immobile. <laughs> <laughs> Could not move. Could not move. I'm like, oh shit! Uh, uh, oh, somebody help me! I have to pee. I. Uh, Martha, where are my pills? <laughs> yeah. The child's saying, hey, I got to go to work at four. Am I going to call in sick because you can't yeah. drive me? You're not physically able to right. drive? Right. I, I forced myself through it. Yeah. And I, I oh, my damn, found my cane because I have a cane. Yeah. Uh, I'm regularly in terrible shape and do stupid things to my body. So. Yeah. <laughs> so was, I had a great time. It was a great weekend. It was like me when the day after my very first warped tour mm-hmm. where I did a bit too much jumping and a bit too much moshing. And I was 18 years old sure. at the time. Yeah. Uh, and in better, much better shape than I am now. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, did did a, a bit too much of everything and drank uh, far too little water. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the next morning uh, after sleeping on my friend's couch, which, you know, that's, that's always, always supportive. Yeah. Yeah. Very supportive and, and easy on your body. Uh, I twisted myself around and attempted to stand mm-hmm. and I felt like my calf muscles were going to explode. I still feel that way. Just all the time. My calves. Well, I mean, since. But after. Right. Af- after this weekend, I mean, your they calves use, still they're, hurt. they're usually sore from uh, the, the act of carting my fat body around. But, I mean. <laughs> but, but currently, the current affliction is still affecting yeah, your calves specifically. Still very sore. I, I mean, I, I told you, and I've uh-huh. talked about this before, I think. But uh, uh, at that same water park, I dislocated my kneecap. Right. Still uh, hasn't found it. Yeah, I still don't know where it's at. Yeah. You know, it, it could be anywhere underneath my skin. 
in my body, <laughs> just floating around. We're just floating around the lazy river. <laughs> yeah, it popped out. Yeah. It just slipped out, and it's just uh, it's somewhere floating around the intake system in the water park. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was there with, with Hannah and Josh, mm-hmm. and uh, it, it's weird to think how long ago this was, and they w- they'd only been together like a year at that point, I mm-hmm. think. But this was I was 16 when this happened, which really? in the grand scheme of things is not that long ago because I'm no, not up. It's not 10 years ago. Yeah, I'm not a very young person. I'm not. I um, am a very young person. I was going to. There were two sentences there. One was I am a very young person. Or I'm the other not was, a very old person. I am not a very old person. Uh-huh. And they got combined together for the exact wrong mm-hmm. uh, statement. I, I was actually long for the ride the whole time. You, I, I knew, you I were exactly. tracking that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but in any case, uh, we were going around on the water slides, having yeah. a fun time. We went up the the inner tube slide. Sure. Which is, they have a cool inner tube slide. Yeah, it's real long yeah. and it goes, you know, it, it's covered. Mm-hmm. Uh, and oh, it's you went on the purple one. Yeah. Yeah. I went on the purple one. Or yeah. I think it was black at the time. Oh. Um, but it's completely dark throughout sure. the whole thing uh-huh. and, uh, uh, you know, getting thrashed around. It's great. Come out to the bottom, uh, into the collection pool. Sure. Uh, which has a pretty strong current in it. Yeah. And generally speaking, they don't have signage up, but mm-hmm. it's probably advisable to stay on the inner tube. Mm-hmm. As you float towards the stairs of the collection pool. It is, yes. That is not what I did. <laughs> what I did was as soon as I cleared the water slide, I jumped off into the water of the collection pool um, and planted my right foot mm-hmm. on the ground. And the current carried uh, the rest of my body away with it while my foot stayed precisely where it was. And uh, my whole body sort of twisted in one direction Mm. My leg didn't agree Mm -hmm. that it should do that. Right. And uh, my kneecap just went Mm -hmm. and ended up on the uh, right side of my leg, Mm. which was uh, real gross to look at. (laughs) There was like a shot of pain and I went, ah, and was like, ah, ah. And, you know, just in a bit, in a bit of pain, not a horrible amount of pain. My leg was sort of bent and my Hannah and Josh were like, what the hell? Did, what, what did you do? And I sort of floated up and uh, I can't remember who spotted mm-hmm. my leg first, but they looked into the water. And went, oh, shit. <laughs> uh, and I probably physically yeah. I probably could have um, just popped it back into place. I, I don't think I had the grit to do that, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. But it probably would not have hurt that bad. Yeah. But because I was in a public place, uh-huh. this was a, and this was a private business. Right. They were obligated to contact uh, uh, medical and, services. Right. So they were obligated to call an ambulance. Um, and you went to the hospital in an ambulance? I, I went to the hospital because I had a dislocated kneecap, which right. seems uh, like a lot of overkill. Swatting a fly uh, with a Buick. Yeah, yeah. In, in in retrospect, it seemed like overkill. And I was in, my mom came down. It was like a whole thing that was not, and I was doing, I was doing pretty good throughout most of it. But for some reason, and they had, ju- they had given me a little bit of drugs right before my mom showed up. Mm-hmm. And for some reason, the fact that I was in a hospital bed and this thing had happened to me. And then seeing my mom walk into a hospital room, that's when I started crying. Really? It's just seeing, not because everything hurt, just well, because. the heartbreak in your mom's face. She wasn't, she was just like, what did you do? She oh. was just, you know, she she was slightly concerned, but right. was just like, oh, you know. My son. Yeah, no, she was no, just yeah. slightly concerned. Just <laughs> yeah. like, you hurt yourself. What did you do? Uh-huh. Like, you know, just a, a normal amount of concern. She wasn't worried or anything right. from what I recall. But I saw her and that's when I started crying. Uh-huh. I had also I was also a little high at that point. Sure, right? on pain meds. That I probably didn't need, but pa- pain meds and the uh, the amount of uh, endorphins in your body probably from, from all the water sliding. Yeah, yeah, I was you know I was so hopped up from all the tubular water sliding I was doing. <laughs> Whoa! You know that that same tube you're talking about? It was funny because Max and I were going down in the tandem ones. We mm-hmm. go, he go down by himself and he get to the end of it. Oh, it was kind of fun. Not as fun as when you're with dad because. Oh, yeah. Because there's an extra, you know, 240 pounds. Or right. Whatever. Exactly. And we go, we go sailing down. And the thing is, uh, like one of the times we're up there and uh, this little girl, she was eight. If she was a day 
and she kind of went, eh, and she, she, went down, she went down there, and then the lifeguard immediately nodded at us, like, okay, go now. Go. So you realize <laughs> how fast we're going to go, <laughs> yeah, right? I was, I was very concerned. We were about to murder a, a second <laughs> grader. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> this is about to crush her underneath your inner tube. Yeah. Oh, God. What is, there's some terrible uh, horror movie that came out last year. What the fuck was it called? Uh, it, it was something instead of like, I think the pun it's this isn't it exactly. But the pun was instead of splash zone, it was like slash zone. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and the whole conceit of the film uh-huh. is that there is like this this, you know, drunk high schooler party going on at this water park where like the owner, you know, every year would like turn a blind like like uh, uh open up the the park to like graduating seniors sure and then turn a blind eye to like all the partying that they would do and then the the conceit of the film is that the day of uh on one of the water slides someone slides these two big gigantic razor blades into the this covered water slide um in, in like an x shape and sure People keep going down the fucking slide <laughs> as they get chopped to pieces. Sure. Like they keep on finding conceited ways for people to go down the slide and get chopped into bits. Um, and there's nobody noticing the bodies. Or? No, everyone's no people at the bottom are noticing, but people are way up at the top of the super tall water slide. They don't know what's going. And also, uh, you find out at the end of the movie. Spoilers for anyone who wants to watch this movie. I can't re- even remember the name of. <laughs> Yeah. But uh, uh, you find that the lady, one of the people, she was like the co-owner of the park. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, her husband was like the owner of the park and she was she was the, the co-owner. She was at the top of the slide telling people when to go down. She was the, so ah. she's the one who put the, the blades in there. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, and that's part of why. OK, go down. And it's I watched a review of it. And it's just the clips I saw of the review. You didn't see the whole movie. Yeah, I don't need to see this movie. You you really did. You saw the whole movie. I've seen the whole movie Uh in the clips they showed in this review. I've already seen the whole film. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I don't need to waste 80 minutes of my life. But uh, uh, yeah, water parks. Yeah, love it. They're fun. Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't gone swimming all summer. Really? I've been to the lake a bunch of times. Mm -hmm been kayaking i haven't gone swimming you need to go to roosevelt because we got two new water slides here did you know that i i mean i did not two new water slides because there was already one there yeah they knocked that down last year okay uh and there's a new water slide they were replaced with two replaced with one that's actually pretty bitching it's uh it's just like a regular, like, like the green one at the the Raging Rivers. It goes around, you come yeah. out into the sun. It's fast, and you go at the bottom. Uh, I mean, there's no uh, there's no pool at the bottom. Okay, they're, they're both just uh, sort of the, the, the long track, the long track at the yeah. end that slows you down because it's full of water. Yeah. and the other one is just a drop. I mean, from the same height. Nice. It is awesome. Did, did you go on those slides at Raging Rivers? The the really tall drop ones. I didn't, and I don't. I don't know why. Those are fun. Um, I, Those yeah, are really fun. I mean, they kind of hurt your back a little bit, the, but they're you know, real fun. I and, and Maximus was saying, you know, I like the the one that's got bumps. It goes woo, and then woo, woo, woo the tall drop. But I'm like, like, that one gives me a bloodied spine. Yeah, that, that one would kill you. Yeah. Uh, the uh, drop, the just drop one is okay. I, I think there is probably a weight limit for those for those slides I'm simply not because that overweight. I know, but like, <laughs> I, I don't know what the what they determine the weight limit to be sure. as far as. Okay, at what weight does your momentum mm-hmm. get you airtime? Right. In a dangerous quantity. <laughs> like like what weight do you have to be when you go fucking flying and you're going to break some bones? Cuz I did that that very water slide at the Kenosi up in uh, Lake Kenosi in Canada. In Canada. In Canada and um yeah, I did end up getting her. I, I flew off of those, and that was back when I was like 125 pounds. Yeah. I was flying off. So I mean, my ass would probably go to the fucking moon. Like, and we never saw Kale again. His little twinkle as I, you know, sure. go up into the atmosphere, Team Rocket style. Sure. <laughs> um, and there, there are your shorts at the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> How did, why did his, 
Was he going so fast that his clothes came off? <laughs> yeah. Is Kale's corpse naked on the moon right now? I'm just soaring through space, <laughs> just completely naked. You haven't watched, uh, 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 uh I almost said true detective. Uh, it is a detective. You haven't watched Twin Peaks season three yet. Oh, no, I haven't seen season three yet. Uh, so uh, mild spoilers. There is a scene where the uh, naked body of Colonel Briggs floats through space. Uh, you know what? Don't explain it. Major Briggs. Or, major Briggs. Uh, or, he floats through space. <laughs> and they, it's explained, isn't it? Or is it? Sometimes I mean it doesn't really that one didn't really need to be explained not that it's not like weird and slightly you know confusing but it it it, it didn't it makes a some amount of sense in context or at the very least it fits yeah in context I don't know cuz nothing really makes a ton of sense <laughs> you can it's re- really whatever you make of it in a lot of ways there is a story Mm -hmm. obviously uh but there's a lot of different ways to interpret what happens in season three sure but or really in season one season two as well yeah think about it but those those are at the very least uh there's a a clearer through line from most of season one and season two sure that is uh it feels more like what you expect uh, a a a television show to feel like A a television show a television yeah new from CBS (laughs) CBS <laughs> Television. <laughs> it's, like, RCA. it's like television, but um drunk. <laughs> but everyone's drunk. <laughs> it's television. Television. <laughs> That's just drunk history, basically. <laughs> yeah. Uh but yeah, it's it, it's season three of Twin Peaks. Is that you have to remember it's an 18 hour long David Lynch movie. Sure. Rather than uh, you know, the third season of the television show Twin Peaks. Mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. it's the same story and characters as the TV show, but it is told like a David Lynch movie rather than a, a, a television show. Um, but there is there is a story. It just it's moves real slow. It's mm-hmm. at its own pace because at this point in his career, that's David Lynch's whole thing is just like I am holding on these shots as long as I fucking want to. Mm -hmm. And no one's going to tell me shit. (laughs) I'm David fucking Lynch, and this is my goddamn rodeo. (laughs) This is my golden sunshine. This is my golden sunshine. (laughs) There is there is a scene of him having like a production meeting with his, uh, you know, some of his producers while Mm -hmm. they're filming season three and him getting just the angriest I've ever seen David Lynch get Mm -hmm. about how like uh goal oriented all of them are and like you know stop fucking telling me you, you know that we need to move on to the next scene okay if i if, if i'm taking more time with the scene it's because i think it needs more time fucking shit <laughs> it's like geez david all right he needs that transcendental meditation for something i guess but yeah, it's just it's like I've never seen David Lynch so angry about anything other than when somebody asked him what he thought of product placement. Right. Bullshit. <laughs> Total fucking bullshit. I love David Lynch. Uh, He's a treasure. He is a treasure. Tre- a treasure. A treasure. Yes. Frank Welker. <laughs> I'll never get over that. Frank Welker. Frank Welker is the guy who does a voiceover for like a lot of cartoons. Yeah, and stuff. That, that's what I was. He was. That's how Fred from Scooby Doo says treasure. Right. He treasure. Says, treasure. Right. That is Frank Welker. OK. You're right. Yeah. Uh, it's so weird. I don't know. What accent is that? I, I don't that's know. Not, that's not. That's no. Did somebody at a broadcast school in 1950 teach him that or what? But. I wonder if somebody in the in the director's booth there's like for Scooby Doo uh, say Frank um, what did you just say? <laughs> <laughs> Fuck it, we it, this you know, is a cartoon yeah. in the early seventies. We have no budget. Uh, we don't have time to argue about this. Just let, what move on. Next let scene. the voice actors do whatever they do. Yeah. Next next line, Frank. <laughs> well, gee, Scoob. <laughs> Well, gosh, Scoob. <laughs> that's what Fred sounds like. <laughs> Somebody's goofy. That's what Fred Rogers. Fred Rogers. Fred. No. <laughs> it's Freddie. Velma. Uh, 
No. What are they? What are? What are all their names? It's Fred. It's uh um. I can't remember. It's Shaggy Rogers. Yeah, but that's not his real first name. Yeah, but it's Shaggy Rogers. Yeah. Obviously. Daphne Blake, Velma, Mortenstein, <laughs> and uh, no. Fred Herzog. Fred. <laughs> Scooby. Scooby. We're going to have to. Scooby, where are we going now? <laughs> I am so very frightened. <laughs> like Scooby. What if we had a Scooby snack? <laughs> I would kill to hear Werner Herzog do line reading of Scooby Doo scripts. That would be great. That would be. A, I would. I would. I would pay a lot of money for that. Jinkies. <laughs> Gade Zooks. <laughs> Zoinks. Zoinks. <laughs> Rut row Shaggy. <laughs> Rut, sorry, let me do that again. Rot row raggy. <laughs> <laughs> what if that's the what if that's the only thing yeah. that he gets perfect? What if Werner Herzog does a perfect impression of Scooby laughing? Uh, like that would be <laughs> that would be terrifying. It would be. Just hearing that come out of Werner Herzog. It's like <laughs> nothing should ever come out of you with this much energy. You know, we've never heard him laugh. What if that's it? What if that's his actual you, you only hear him very serious and very I feel like I have heard him laugh. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I feel like I have heard him laugh, uh -huh. but it is a very it's the laugh you would expect Werner Herzog to have, <laughs> where it's just kind of like a slightly amused, rather quiet giggle. Just like, <laughs> yes, yes, very funny. That is the funniest thing I ever, ever seen. This my, is my sides. This is the happy. I am so very happy in this moment. Yes, you know what they say about German humor, right? It's no laughing matter. Oh, that's right. Exactly. Um, well, who was it was talking about that in the, in their uh, special or whatever? Oh, it was uh, it was Pat Oswalt. It was. So, talking about going to Germany and they they refuse to acknowledge jokes over there because next thing you know you're going to be talking about the Holocaust we can't fucking do that <laughs> <laughs> they just have a hair trigger for for talking about the war yeah because he said they were in his routines where he was in a cab and they were going by a nightclub that had like a whole bunch of like laser pointers his effects or whatever he says oh the snipers are out tonight and, uh, and and the cabbie was like, no, you don't understand. Those are laser pointers that are pointed to the disco to make an effect. Uh, it's not any. There's no, the, you know, there are no snipers. There's no, no snipers. war going on right now. Knock, knock. Who's there? It is the Jews. And we are <laughs> glad that they are coming here. We're going to give them a nice picnic. <laughs> we will treat them very well. <laughs> <laughs> we've moved past all that these are our only jokes <laughs> That's, uh, yeah I do love uh, whenever I see um, uh, is it Henning Vane uh, on British panel shows he's a mm -hmm. German comedian uh, that appears on certain British channel uh, uh, panel shows yeah and he's, he's genuinely very funny but in the most German way like he has even drier than British humor, which really? is saying something. Wow. He's he's dry for the Brits. He's fucking bone dry. Because the, uh, the air in uh, in most of uh, what is the Great Britain is usually about 115% humidity. Yeah, it's very humid. Right. So they need something to, to, they need to be dry. dry right. To be dry. Because everything is always damp there. Yeah. It's very moist in England. Yeah. England is moist. England is a very moist country. All right. That's, that's enough of that. <laughs> How many listeners did we just lose? <laughs> Not that it matters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. If you're listening, you matter. You, you matter. matter. Not in, you know, a cosmic sense, but right. in a personal sense. Sure, you matter to us. I mean, the rest of the universe will nary notice you existed. Yeah. But we whether know. there are sent Whether there are other sentient beings out there mm -hmm. or not, they will not notice you. Your birth and subsequent death are... Means not, nothing to them. Not even a blip on the radar. But you matter to us, and that's what matters. Welcome to anti nihilism. <laughs> Which is yeah. actually like like if you read about, you know, like the 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 trope of anti nihilism uh -huh. on the internet, that's just what actual nihilism is supposed to be. Sure. 
It's just that the pessimists grabbed on to Nietzsche and and sort of twisted it for their own means. Right. <laughs> Where, from what I understand, the man himself, his idea of this philosophy was essentially like, yeah, nothing matters. And that means everything kind of matters because life is absurd and right. you get to imbue everything you do with your own meaning. Exactly. Uh, rather than being a cynical, pessimist dickhead about everything all the time. Uh-huh. Uh, but. Yeah, that's how I look at it. I yeah. mean, other people, you know, when I, th- I think, well, eh, there's probably nobody seeing me right now. That's awesome. Great. I'm, I'm not being surveilled. Nobody cares if I'm an idiot all the time. Yeah. There's no. Yeah. Just just do do as you will. Me and my wife and kids. Yeah. Well, yeah. They've accepted it by you, this point. You matter to other people. Yeah. You don't have to matter in a, a cosmic sense. You don't have to mm-hmm. have any sort of metaphysical purpose. The the people in your life and what you mean to them should be enough. Anyway, let's uh, get down off of our little philosophy box. Dream theater. And talk about dream theater. Sure. So uh, we've talked about dream theater uh, numerous times mm-hmm. before. Mm-hmm. Uh, dream theater, if you don't know, however, is a, a, a American progressive metal band. Uh, from Massachusetts, I believe they're specifically from. Let me check here. I feel like they're from a little. They're a little all over. They are a little all over, actually. That maybe it's New York. Yeah, uh, I thought it was New York. Most most of them are uh, from the the New England area. Right. Uh, they met at, at Berkeley in Boston. Um, sure. Uh, Portnoy, Myung, and Berkeley, and John Petrucci. Yeah, Berkeley's Berk- in California. B e r k l e e. Oh, there's there's Berkeley College of Music. Oh, OK. Berkeley College of Music versus the Berkeley College in, in, in California. Right. The amount of uh, uh, dropouts that Berkeley has experienced yeah. because musicians met each other and formed bands mm-hmm. has got to be a fairly significant <clears throat> percentage of like the attendance they've ever had. Or the other side of that cookie, uh, musicians met each other and went, oh, I hate these guys. <laughs> and decided to you know get an English degree. <laughs> It could be. Yeah, that could be. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they I think they are all kind of from all over. I think Portnoy at the very least is from the Boston. Well, Labrie is had, from Canada. Yeah, he? Labrie is uh, from from Quebec. Yeah, I think. Um, is he French? Does he speak a little accent? Uh, he has a, a little bit of an accent. Not, mm. He doesn't have a, a really strong, you know, mm. Quebecois accent, but he is. It's there. Um, let me check where. Look at my square from. jaw. My my square jaw and puffy face. <laughs> how, how, how. Oh, that's John Petrucci. Uh, Petrucci is from Kings Park, New York. Oh, okay. Uh, where is James Labrie from? <clears throat> James Labrie. He is from... Oh, boy. Pe- mm. Penetanguishene. Ontario. Oh, he's uh, from he's, Ontario. He's from Ontario. Ontario, yeah. Yeah. I thought he was French Canadian. Well, for yeah. Some reason. Part of Ontario is French. Yeah. Uh the the name is is uh, is native. Ojibwa? I never remember how to pronounce that. Ojibwa. Ojibwa. Yeah. Anyway, uh that's the town that he grew up in. All right. Uh but but uh Images and Words. Uh-huh. Is their second album. Second album. This was released in 1992. It was after their original singer, Charlie Dominici, left the band. Mm -hmm. Their first album was kind of, uh, you know, not super. It it was a bit of a disappointment for them, essentially. Uh, Didn't get them a ton of attention. So they regrouped. uh, They... Well, they didn't, they didn't get new members, but they was they went back to the drawing board a bit. Yeah, more or less. I think the uh, I, I've never listened. I've never listened to their first album. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not a, it's not on Spotify either. The like Spotify considers their discography to start with, with this. this album <laughs> and with with James Labrie. So sure. I haven't I haven't heard that first album. And most Dream Theater fans uh, don't really care about that album generally mm-hmm. speaking like when you when you see if you see lists of like every dream theater album ranked it's usually pretty low uh in the this rankings. album is yeah mm-hmm. it's it's usually uh not rated very highly amongst fans you know as far as musicality and uh and, and talent and songwriting and stuff like that goes this is far above a lot of other things yeah no nah. this is this is them uh this is the lineup they would have for uh, four of the members anyway uh, would remain until Mike sure. Portnoy left the band in 2010. Mm-hmm. 
But uh, at the time, they had a keyboardist named Kevin Moore, mm-hmm. um, who uh, was with them for one more album after this. And then I, I can't remember who replaced him in the late 90s uh, and was with them for one album. And then, then, the they, hired, then they hired Jordan Rudis uh-huh. uh, before Metropolis Part 2. And that which lineup. is a full album. Yes. Uh, so that a so follow that's up to a song, a song yeah. on this album. Yeah, uh, that was so th- there's a song on this album that's called Metropolis Part One, The Miracle and the Sleeper. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they called it Metropolis Part One as a joke. Um, like, sure. hey, what if, you know, we called it Metropolis Part One? Like History of the World Part One. Yeah. The movie. Or Loaded Weapon One. That was the end of the movie. Yeah. Like, what if we yeah. called it that, you know, just as just as a thing? And then everyone was like, hey, are you going to make a sequel to that? <laughs> like, shit. I guess. I guess. Well, <laughs> we could work. And then they made a really fucking amazing album out of it, mm-hmm. uh, out of the, the basic concept uh, of the that track. But um, there's a lot of great songs on this. So this is this was like before you met me Mm -hmm. and I forced more Dream Theater on you. This was like your only exposure to Dream Theater. This and the the live album where they did covers. Uh, I that I haven't uh, watched slash listened to. Uh, Like their their version of Perfect Strangers is amazing. I know. uh, I think I we watched a video where they did a cover of a Metallica song uh-huh. and Barney Greenway was singing with them. <laughs> yeah. Which was insane. Mm-hmm. Uh, of of all people <laughs> to be on stage with Dream Theater, it's Barney fucking Greenway from Napalm Death. <laughs> um, but he really likes prog rock. Yeah, he's, we a, know uh, that. he's a massive prog rock fan and mm-hmm. I, I presume a huge Dream Theater fan. Right. Uh, but... Um, yeah, I just I'm endlessly tickled by that that happening. But uh, this this album uh, basically has had the lasting legacy of being like one of their most commercially successful. Sure. Uh, I mentioned earlier that it's got like their only top 10 hit mm-hmm. like radio or otherwise on it. And that is Pull, Pull Me, Me Under, Under which right. is the first song. This is a very emotional album. There's yeah. a lot of. A lot of it on there. A lot, uh, a lot of open hearts. None of the lyrics uh, on this are, are written by Labrie, by the way. Oh, really? He was just the singer. I don't know how much of this was written before Labrie joined the band. but um, And that mm-hmm. sort of uh, remained for, for quite a while. Labrie pretty rarely contributed lyrics mm-hmm. and was basically just there to, to, to be the singer, more or less. Mm-hmm. And lyrics were usually handled by everyone else sure. in, in some capacity. Everybody but... Mainly, mainly yeah. John and Mike were the two main lyricists. Then the other John, right. uh, John, John Petrucci and Mike Portnoy mm-hmm. were contributed the majority of the lyrics. John Myung occasionally. And then uh, Kevin Moore actually wrote the lyrics for Pull Me Under. Um, uh, and uh, the rest of the band sort of split lyrical duties for the rest of the album. <laughs> uh, I think duties can look at this uh who wrote who wrote metropolis part one that was john petrucci Ah, okay sure lyrics for that one because i think it was mostly portnoy that did the album that Mm -hmm. did metropolis part two that was mostly his stuff mike portnoy um with bits of of john petrucci in there and then i think i think james (laughs) bits of john petrucci all (laughs) over the place he exploded. He's yeah. reformed though, because sure. he's got the you know he's he's a Greek tension. He's a Greek god. Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, Is he in the liquid tension experiment? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's him, Portnoy, Rudis, and uh, from King Crimson, Hetfield. Tony Tony oh. Levin. Levin. Tony uh, Tony Levin. Yeah. Tony Levin. Uh, Ooh, we should really do a King Crimson album at some point. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I would probably be pretty into it. I, actually, yeah. Their, their first album is amazing. Amazing. It's real short, but it's amazing. Like a like a Slayer album. I mean, it's in yeah. length in length and being amazing and yeah. no other ways. <laughs> there, there's guitars on there. <laughs> and you can and hear yes, a, there are guitars and drums and bass uh-huh. on both of those. And and you can hear a, a man's voice. Yes. A human being uh-huh. making noise. Sure. Those are ways in which the two albums are similar. Yes. Um uh let's see what uh i did a 
remarkable amount of not preparing for this. <laughs> that's that's fine. Uh, so generally, uh, review scores. Most of this is is retrospective stuff, mm-hmm. uh, but review scores are very high for this. Um, and generally speaking, I think as far as like its um, uh, legacy goes, it falls like if people are making lists of like greatest prog metal or prog rock albums of all time, mm-hmm. typically with prog metal, because there's there's a lot there's big names in prog rock. Right. That do that are definitely not metal. Uh, Pink like, Floyd, the Moody Blues. Yeah. That, even King Crimson is not metal. Yeah. That are yeah. probably going to end up even if Dream Theater deserves to be, you know, high up on those same lists by virtue of talent alone. The fact that they are a much less known quantity than those other huge bands. Sure. Is those other gonna, bands have been around for 55 years. Yeah. Probably going to land them uh, much further down those lists. But as far as like prog metal albums go, uh, usually uh, this album and Metropolis Part 2 mm-hmm. end up at least both in the top five. Sure. Um, Metropolis Part 2, I think, trends to end up a little bit higher. Mm-hmm. Um but uh, yeah, they're they're kind of neck and neck as far as like people's favorite Dream Theater albums mm-hmm. uh, and where they end up. I think um, Six Degrees of Inner Turbulence usually ends up pretty high as well. Uh, just like if the top 25 if, of any list you look up for greatest prog metal, metal albums, yep. the top 25 is pretty fucking packed with Dream Theater <laughs> albums. Sure. It's the top 25 is all Dream Theater and Mashuga, essentially. I guess, yeah, Meshuggah is progressive metal, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's a much more extreme progressive metal, right. but you'd struggle to call it anything else. Right, it does, yeah. Uh, if if those drum patterns aren't prog, I don't know what the <laughs> fuck prog is. <laughs> yeah. Is Thomas, is it Thomas Hacke? Hacke, yeah. Uh, is, he's a fucking octopus. He is. I don't know how he does that shit. Uh, it's mind-boggling. Um I remember is uh, there's clips of Bill Burr mm-hmm. talking about being taken to a Mashuga album, yeah. a Mashuga concert, right? He's and he's just it, extolling the virtues of Mashuga because he for a long time he's been learning how to play the drums, right. and he's just and he's just like this is you know I'm not an extreme metal guy. I did wasn't into the vocals, but the drumming was you know mind boggling. <laughs> um, but yeah, this this uh, uh, is pretty. Pretty well regarded mm-hmm. uh, in the the lineage of Dream Theater albums. Which Some favorite? of the songs oh, uh, I wanted to talk about. Uh, so if you're wondering, uh, the song "Another Day" almost has like almost like a religious sort of yeah, feel to it. This is second track, right? Uh, yeah. That specifically it was written about John Petrucci's dad, who had recently passed away. Sure. Uh, when this album had come out, um, and then some of the other ones. I mean, we talked about Metropolis Part One. That's those are the ones that I could find like, yeah, like specific information about. Because I was curious, mm-hmm. like, what mm-hmm. is the what is the deal with Another Day? What is this about? Right. Um, and that's that's what it was. My, my, I think my favorite album on this is Met- Metrop- you Metropolis. Metropolis. Your part favorite one. song on yeah. it. Yeah. Why? You said your favorite album. <laughs> We're falling into that trap a lot today. <laughs> Both of us. Just saying the wrong words constantly. I mean, there is an album with a very similar name. That That's is probably what happened. Se- that is a sequel up to that here song. In the, in the kidney inside my skull. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think Metropolis Part 1 is... This is my my favorite track on this. It's a really really good track. It is. Uh, that's that's what I would name as my favorite as well. I think uh, "Under a Glass Moon" mm-hmm. deserves a special shout out. I think that's a really good track. Um, and I, I really like "Learning to Live" as well. The yeah. the closing track. Yeah. "Pull Me Under" is really great as well. Sure. Uh, there's a lot of really really great tracks on this. And we were talking about how uh-huh. like this is so this is pre food poisoning incident. James Labrie. Yeah. And you had mentioned, like, he must not have been planning to do this for very long. Yeah. <laughs> because you can't do a lot of the things he does in early Dream Theater, you know, as an old man. Yeah. that's It's just a thing that your body will not allow you to do. I think uh, of all the people in the known universe who have managed to do that as an old man, I think King Diamond is, is the, probably, <laughs> like, the only, the only person. Guy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> There is a point where there is this really long sustained high note, I think, in um, 
uh, another day mm -hmm. where he holds this really long sustained high note and when he lets it out you can hear like the the damage he just did to his vocal cords practically like the last millisecond of that note as he lets it go you can hear some grit sure suddenly in there like like his vocal cords were had been tight 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 and they got let loose and just flapped for a little bit sure like that's not how biology works but it's just you know yeah that's how it sounds i i imagine this was his fifth take on that particular thing yeah that uh, james could be can you too. do it again oh god damn it Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, he had previously <laughs> been in a glam metal band. Uh -huh. Surprising no one that that James Labrie had come out of a glam metal band sure. uh, called Winter Rose mm -hmm. uh, from from Canada. From Canada. From Canada. Blame Hi there, Philip. <laughs> Hi, Hans. What, what are you doing today, Philip? <laughs> That's what that's what all Canadians sound like. Shut your fucking face, Uncle Fucker. <laughs> they all look like the Canadians from South Park. That's what James Labrie actually looks like. I'm imagining James Labrie as a Canadian from South Park. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what yeah. what if what if it was uh, Trailer Park Boys, but they're all Canadians from South Park? That would be awesome. That'd be great. Um, uh, anyway. Anywho. Anywho, anyhow. Uh talking about this album. Yeah, that was that was my favorite track on here. Does this slap? Uh at times it does. Parts, yeah, parts yeah. of it. Uh and this like this album and songs on this album sort of fall into the same uh territory as as every Dream Theater album, where it's it's not always metal. Right, no. There are there are songs on this where you would call you would call it a prog rock or mm -hmm. or even some sometimes like a soft rock almost. Mm -hmm. um, they, they don't they don't put themselves in a, in a corner. Yeah, but there are riffs where it's like that's a metal riff right yeah, yeah. there, mm -hmm. uh, where it's like unmistakably you know the riff and the guitar tone is like oh that's that's metal right there. Like if you went all went to all the big metal bands and said what do you think about the metal band Dream Theater? Like that's a good metal band. Yeah, yeah. nobody <laughs> no nobody would tell you that you're wrong right necessarily, but uh, uh, words images words. words. <laughs> Images and words. What 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 song is it that comes up in? Is that uh, that's oh um um I think that is it's one of the last ones. Y yeah. Is it Wait for Sleep? Yes, I Wait for Sleep. Wait that, for Sleep. That one was also the lyrics for Wait for Sleep were also written by Kevin Moore mm -hmm. along with the song Surrounded. Now now that I'm seeing he actually had a lot more credits uh, than I <laughs> uh, had remember him having. He also wrote part of Take the Time, mm -hmm. uh, which is that one's like the most sort of like rock kind of metal song on there mm. um it's a shorter one isn't it yeah i believe it is it's take the, actually no oh, it's it's, not? it's eight minutes oh long. yeah because this album does that it, you, the songs are either three minutes or eight and a half minutes yeah i mean that's just that's <laughs> prog rock for you baby it's true yeah. that's prog that's that's prog rock and i imagine one thing that does help live for james labrie if he's got to sing these songs is the fact that he sings uh eight lines and then and then gets to go smoke a cigarette and have a coffee yeah and then come back in 20 minutes and sing the end of the song well that's what you know <laughs> if they're playing a live show uh -huh. that's what the dance of eternity is for from metropolis part two sure right because it's it's one of their more popular tracks off of that album mm -hmm. uh because it's so incredibly fucking wild as far as the complexity of it goes right I've showed you that video of Mike Portnoy counting, uh, like counting out the time for that and uh -huh. him struggling to keep up with it verbally. His song. Yeah, yeah. the song he <laughs> fucking wrote. Um, but like they, they will play that song live and James just kind of goes backstage for a little bit. Comes back out with a tambourine. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. And there's no microphone. He's, yeah. just kind of <laughs> yeah, he's not even mic'd up. <laughs> he's, he's just, just playing a tambourine. And he just comes, yeah, he just comes back out with a tambourine, <laughs> lets his voice rest for seven and a half minutes, <laughs> and then gets back to it. Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, this is, I, I really enjoy this. Although there's one thing. Hmm. The only thing about this I don't enjoy. Yeah. And I mentioned this before we started, before we started recording. And it's something I cannot unhear now. Sure. And it's something that I notice a little bit 
listening to this previously, but I didn't know why. Uh, so they got into a, no, a number of like clashes with their producer, mm-hmm. um, who seems to have been a big old asshole. Mm-hmm. Uh, at points, he would like lock them out of the recording studio sure. for some reason. Uh, and he forced Mike Portnoy to use not only triggered samples for the bass drums, but also triggered samples for the snare drum, Mm -hmm. which is really, really weird to me Mm -hmm. because there's a lot of albums I have listened to that use triggered bass. It's Mm -hmm. almost standard for extreme metal. Right, because you're playing so fast. So it's that like human feet don't move that fast. Or they do move that fast, but because you're playing, you know, a physical instrument, the sound might get a little mushy. Sure. Um, and so to to pres- to keep things a little crisp, sometimes you will you will use triggered bass drums. Sure. But most of the time everything else is natural unless you're using an entirely electric drum kit, sure. which some bands do. Infant Annihilator does that. Yes. Um, but that band is also completely insane. Right. So that's off the charts. Yeah. Why wouldn't you? But um, uh, uh, yeah, it just boggles. If you don't know what triggered drums are, uh-huh. uh, you can basically put a it, it's like a um, it, it's similar to the the frame of the drum. It's it's mm-hmm. a it's like a it's a sensor, more or less, mm-hmm. that you can attach to the head of a drum. Uh, that senses whenever you hit the drum. Mm -hmm. And instead of a microphone picking up the sound of you hitting the drum. Well, it kind of is a microphone. It kind kind of is. It kind of is a microphone. And then it relays the fact that there is, you know, uh, a... There is an electrical signal that gets sent to a computer. Basically sending it a number. Which tells that computer to play uh, Mm -hmm. in the recording uh, that's going on or in the, you know, the the live performance that's going on. Sure. You can, you use them live as well. Uh, it, it, it sends a signal that plays a, uh, audio sample, a audio file. Mm -hmm. That is a recording of, uh, someone else at some point hitting a drum. Sure. In that same way. Uh, this can be, this is useful in a number of different ways. But um, some people frown on it uh-huh. because it's not, you know, it's not analog. It's not, you know, but uh, there there are realities of making music that uh, necessitate or at the very least make using triggered drum samples mm-hmm. the much easier option. But this being 1992, when you're recording a prog metal album. Right. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. No. Um, it just seems bizarre and as far as i know they didn't they wouldn't go back to him and i think starting with metropolis part two i might be wrong about this but i Mm. think starting with that they began like self-producing all their own stuff sure you know they would rent out a recording space but they would record and produce their stuff themselves Mm -hmm. uh i think i might be wrong about take turns engineering yeah uh i i think portnoy and petrucci were you know the ones leading the charge on that Mm -hmm. um but yeah, it's just so now I hear like it, the bass, the bass drum doesn't bother me. Right. But I hear the snare because the snare sounds exactly the fucking same every time. And mm-hmm. you can use like different samples. Sure. Most. But this was 1992. And I have to wonder how big, you know, a database this engineer had of drum samples to pull mm-hmm. from mm-hmm. because it sounds exactly the same in a way that sounds very artificial and it bothers the living shit out of me. And I'm sure I I, I have to wonder if Mike Portnoy has difficulty listening to this album. <laughs> um, James Labrie has said that this is like his favorite album that they did. Really? Um, but yeah, I have, I have to wonder, like as the drummer that was forced to do this shit that he probably did not want to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have to wonder if, if Mike Portnoy you know, can really listen to this without going Ugh, every time he hits the snare. Uh, Cause it, it bugs me. Sure. And I didn't, it, it like, I feel like I'm going to have trouble listening to this album in the future without that in the back of my head. It's not nearly as apparent on like the softer songs mm-hmm. uh, where there's very little drums anyway. Um, also, I think that another thing that bothers me a little bit, Kevin Moore's keyboard playing is great. Sure. But the, uh, some of the keyboard sounds 
are kind of kind of goofy sounding kind of cheesy, uh, yeah. kinda cheesy. Mm -hmm. like like in, in a way that like rudis's keyboards usually fit the tone of the music mm -hmm. a bit more nothing's terribly out of place on here mm -hmm. but the the sound profiles that they went with in certain spots just take me out of it a little bit right they don't feel like they fit quite as well as as something that that the wizard would do <laughs> <laughs> the keyboard wizard jordan yes. rudis uh but um yeah it's it, there's 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 nothing that i hate about this album this mm -hmm. is this is very good and it's dream theater and i love dream theater sure but uh uh what what metal are you bestowing upon this album like maz Kanata to chewbacca i i say it deserves a gold I agree with you. This yeah. deserves a gold. This is right up there with their their best stuff. Mm -hmm. My problems with the the my very specific granular problems with it aside. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a very enjoyable album to mm -hmm. listen to. Um, and it's not I think it's also pretty accessible as far as Dream Theater stuff goes. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, it's, you know, chart performance would probably agree with that statement. Right. And, and the you know, it's legacy as like their most commercially successful. But um, I, I think this is their most accessible work from a lot of different angles. Mm -hmm. um, Metropolis Part One gets pretty weird in a lot of ways. It does. Throughout it. A lot of fun ways. A lot of very fun ways. And yeah. I think that song was kind of the thesis statement for them as a band going forward mm -hmm. of like, okay, this is the band that we want to be. Because I have to imagine after that first album being kind of disappointing for them, if they were wondering like, what kind of band do we want to be uh, going forward? Mm -hmm. Are we going to be just a, a generic rock band are we going to be a prog metal band? Are we going to be a prog rock band? Like, what kind of band are we going to be? And then they make that and go like, okay, let's, because, you know, after that, they only get weirder and more complex sure. and and more, you know, deep, you know, weird and, and, and uh, uh, not difficult to listen to, but right. just obscure little bits and and so much detail pumped into to every single album sure. that, that only increases from this point on right it becomes a, a real carnival ride i mean it does a yeah. roller coaster their songs are are uh, uh, like a a roller coaster yeah. or like a like a really weird disney dark ride sure like <laughs> like a dark ride at a theme park that was made in the 70s when everybody all the you know, ride designers were on drugs, so they made it like really scary. Ooh, you know what I want to hear the band uh, play? What? It's a small world after all. Can't do it. It's in four four. <laughs> they, they wouldn't. No one get it. They no refuse. One. Yeah. <laughs> they 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 can't. They don't remember how to play in four four. It's like in Metalocalypse. Yeah. Where they have to learn how to uh, uh, squeeze scar and Toki have to learn how to play uh, blues guitar, yeah, uh, in order to like make a deal with the devil, uh -huh. um, and they're physically incapable of playing slowly. Like they're picking up acoustic guitars, and this like blues guy is trying to teach them how to play the blues, uh -huh. and immediately they just start doing like super fast like sweep arpeggios and shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's like, we don't know how to play slowly. <laughs> we only play fast. Uh, I miss Metalocalypse. Mm. I wish Metalocalypse was still around. Next week, what are you thinking for albums? Uh, I, it, it was, I was juggling a few things. And then after having re-listened to this, I think maybe we can stay on the uh, the prog metal uh, wheelbarrow here. I, I imagine uh, uh, the guys at Dream Theater are probably uh, Dream Theater. Dream Theater. Dream Theater. Next week on television. <laughs> President Ford has <laughs> died. I'm Tom Broca. Well, they, they had to have been uh, at least somewhat influenced by the band Fate's Warning. Probably. Yeah. Uh, probably. Fate's Warning, the album uh, No Exit. We should probably give that a spin. No Exit by For, Fate's Warning. 1986, I believe. Okay. I wasn't asking you. I didn't, yeah, I didn't think you were just do. thinking. But I'm yeah. just, I'm, <laughs> I believe you. Sure. And I'm I'm down. Fate's Warning. All right. No Exit. Mm -hmm. That's next week. I, the week after that, I think we're going to talk about uh, a band that I've recently uh, gotten into over the last 
24 hours. Yeah. Uh, the band is called Mizmore. I'm looking uh, forward to that. And it's a like uh, blackened doom metal project. Uh-huh. We'll talk about their newest album, Cairns. Uh, nice. which I think is is really, really interesting. Right, and middle-aged women shouting at uh, checkout uh, people. Yeah, not not Karens, Cairns, <laughs> yeah. like a pile of rocks that sure. you hit a body underneath. Right, you're not hiding the body, you're just... It's burying it. Yeah, disposing uh, of the body. But... Uh, Disposal of the bodies. Sorry, was that a cannibal corpse? Lyric? Yes, it was. <laughs> it sounded like you were doing a corpse grinder impression, so I figured yeah. it was a cannibal corpse. That's your gallery of suicide. Also, considering that it's the lyric is disposal of the bodies, like right, cannibal probably, corpse. It's probably a cannibal corpse yeah. lyric, uh, or like evidence in the furnace is another <laughs> cannibal corpse song. Sure. What's the evidence in the furnace? It's the bodies I'm get- disposing of. Of course. It's Cannibal Corpse. We're singing about murder. What the fuck else would we be doing? Um, but yeah, Mismore, Cairns, uh, two yep. weeks from now. And then Fate's Warning next week. Next week. Next week on the Bronze Medalist Podcast. Uh, till you hear from us mm-hmm. next time, why don't you check us out on Facebook or Twitter and follow our pages there and uh, get updates when we upload new episodes otherwise just uh subscribe to our feeds on your apple podcast app or on libsyn's the podcast source thank you very much everybody for listening to another episode of the bronze medalist podcast i'm kale i'm oj congratulations